Hello, my name's Scott Berry. I'm a biostatistician with Berry Consultants. I'm gonna to talk today about rare diseases, slow decline. It's one of the most difficult problems we face in drug development. We have very few patients. The natural decline of the disease is slow. It's very, very difficult. The FDA, Janet Woodcock talks a lot about this being one of the most difficult problems we face. So can Thomas Bayes help? Does the Bayesian approach to this, rethinking the way we do this, can we do better in rare diseases? So what is the issue in rare disease? The biggest issue, of course, the nature of it is it's rare. Very few people have the diseases. We don't have the numbers that we can do things inefficiently, learn what's effective. We have very few subjects. Now, one way to handle this is just lower our standards. Is this really what it's come to that we just have to lower the standards? Maybe in many situations it's very appropriate. Um, it, but of course, it's much worse problem when we have slow decline. If a patient takes 15 years to decline, do we put patients on placebo for 15 years to pick out a difference. Is there a different way? Can we do some Bayesian things that may help here? So in order to determine A is effective, the standard approach is we compare A to B, we run a, a, a trial, we do statistical significance at 5%. You do, not, you, you do the, the, the simple calculations for a rare disease, it's very common that you calculate we need this number of patients and that's more than the number of people who have the disease. We can't run clinical trials, we're stuck. The old standards don't work. We can't run trials like this. It's much worse if putting a subject on treatment B, placebo, for 15 years is then thought to be unethical because of the length of time of, uh, of that to do nothing to somebody who's sick and has, the, has this disease. So, what can we do? Can we, can, one of the problems we also see is the endpoints we select, clinical endpoints in these diseases, typically only apply to a subset of the disease. You have to have the severity of disease that falls within a small window. So you're taking a very rare disease and saying we can only treat one out of every five who have the disease, making it extremely difficult. So let me introduce you to a rare disease, G&E myopathy. Uh, first of all, this work is joint uh, Nuria Carrillo at the NIH, Therapeutics for Rare and Neglected Diseases. Mark Fitzgerald and Melanie Quintana here at Berry Consultants have done a lot of this work as well. I just get to present it. So GNE myopathy is a very rare genetic muscle disease. It's very slowly progressing in terms of many diseases. It has a very interesting uh, progression pattern. It tends to start in the low extremities, in the ankles. The muscles are turning from muscle to fat. And as it does, it works its way up the body. So it affects the ankles first, it moves up through the legs, into the hip area, into the shoulders, eventually, uh, the subjects end up with, with canes, they end up immobile, they end up in a wheelchair, and they eventually die from this. That progression might be 20 to 25 years that it takes to go from initial symptoms to death. Very difficult, make, making a very difficult disease to study in a clinical trial. The estimated prevalence is anywhere from 4 to 21 out of a million, so a very rare disease. Uh, it's frequently misdiagnosed early on that the first symptoms tend to be tripping, falling, maybe late. Uh, it's frequently misdiagnosed early on that the first symptoms tend to be tripping, falling, maybe late 20s, but at different time periods uh, for, for different subjects. No known treatment effect. G&E myopathy is that the muscle does not have the ability to process sialic acid. Hence, it turns from muscle to fat, and we haven't found any treatment for this. Here are pictures, snapshots, of patients at different time points in their progression. These are all different patients. This isn't the same patient. The one on the left has the least burden of disease. You can see that the, the uh, cross section of the muscle has much of the muscle still there. The muscle in the legs is still there. As you go for subjects that are at different points in the disease, you see muscle, much less muscle and much more fat. And the muscle becomes unusable, they become uh, non-ambulatory, end up in a wheelchair.
So you see what, what happens. So in some ways, it's a rather straightforward mechanism of action. It's very well understood. We just have to preserve the ability for the muscle to process sialic acid to prevent this atrophy. There's a natural history database at the NIH. It's a couple years old where there are 32 patients and they've, they've taken every six months, every three to six months, they have a 10 point muscle score, a quantitative muscle assessment being done where they record the muscle strength. It's a really neat endpoint as you'll see because it is adjusted for age, gender, and BMI of what's normal. So what you'll see is the percent of normal for an individual and we can try to see the progression of the disease on this. And what's also neat about it is it ranges from muscles to the ankle all the way up through the body. So you can see some muscles are being atrophied and some are not, and there will be subjects at very different points in the disease. Uh, I'll show you five muscle groups. We're looking at a couple more as part of the disease model uh, as well. And these are the dorsiflex, which is the ankle, the hamstrings, the grip, uh, hip extension as well, uh, and as well as knee extension. This is the quadricep that's going to drive the ability to extend the knee, which you need to walk. So here is patient A, a real patient. You can see their muscle score. This patient is, was 30 years old when they entered the database. They, their last assessment was just before they were 32 years old. Uh, and you can see five different muscles, the yellow, and the red are on top of each other, they're at zero. They have 0% strength in the knee flex that's going this way uh, rather than the extension and the, the ankle. They have no muscle strength whatsoever. So this is a patient that's less than 50% strength on the grip and others at the same time. Here is a patient who at 49 years old is actually much less severe than that last patient. So they have a much less severe disease where they actually have muscles that are more strong than average for their age, BMI, and gender. Uh, it, it, in this case, the, the, the knee extension is down just below one. So older patient, but less sick. Here is patient C, uh, who is at 51 years old. Their dorsiflex has zero strength. Their knee flex is down below 50% and progressing downwards. Uh, you can see, interesting, the grip has an interesting behavior that it looks like it may have even increased over the couple year span. But you can see what these muscle assessments look like. So what the goal of this is, we want to build a, a disease model that we can characterize where is a patient at, at any time during their disease. So what we're, our goal here is for whatever disease age they are is the x-axis and then the muscle strength is the y-axis that you can attach where is the patient at any time and where are they going. That's going to help us in a clinical trial to see if a drug changes our expectation about where they go. So here are, is the entirety of the data on the five different muscles, the dorsiflex in the upper left, the knee flex in the upper middle, grip is the upper right, the hip extension and knee extension in the bottom. So these, these are attached to the same patient across the scale. What we'd hope to see here is that as age as the X variable and the percent strength as the Y variable, we would see a natural pattern to this. That for somebody of a certain age, we can say what their muscle strength should be. You can see we have a, a mass of points in many ways. Can we make heads or tail of this? So one way to explore this disease age concept, instead of chronological age, and you saw those three individuals where the 31-year-old was in worse shape than the 49-year-old. So what we want to do is say, how, what is their disease age? Where that 31-year-old is a very different disease age than the 49-year-old did. So what I, we want to come up with the model, the first easiest way to see could this work is we're going to give everybody a disease age based on their knee flex score only. So what we do is we take on the left, you see chronological age is the X and you see their, their proportion strength is the Y. We now move them to a logistic curve. We fit a logistic curve 
and move them to that and impute a new thing called a disease age and we plot the disease age for that individual as the x-axis. Without, uh, because of, of non-identifiability, we'll just call zero disease age is the point where they have 50% strength. You can see we can move their chronological age to a disease age and this fits very well. But the important thing is what does it do to the other muscles? How well does this newly created disease age match the other muscles? So if we go, we can see at the top here, this is the model estimating disease age at the top, and dorsiflex as reflected by the disease age in the bottom right. This is a tough one. Most of these patients have zero strength. The dorsiflex is the first muscle to go. There are a few of them there. It works pretty well for a few of them. Now we go to grip, and you can see it, the, the mass of points on the left by chronological age fit much better by disease age. So the disease age of knee flex does a much better job of predicting grip effects than just chronological age. We move to hip extension, and this does very, very well. Knee extension predicts hip extension very, very well. So we're starting to see we can classify disease age pretty well in this population. Knee extension is a very interesting muscle. You can see essentially this doesn't change much over the whole disease age. A nickname for this disease is the quadricep sparing disease. It's known that the quadricep for some reason is affected much, much less than every other muscle. And that's what this muscle is. And so it's, this was actually, when we showed this to the researchers, this was reassuring, in fact, that the, 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 the knee extension behaved this way. Now we're going to put it all together. There's no reason to use disease age based on one muscle. We jointly estimate a common disease age parameter for each individual that's a function of a logistic decay model for every muscle. It's dictated by a slope beta for every muscle has its own slope. They all decline at different rates and they all have a different intercept depending on at which point in the disease age do they decline. We then have a disease age alpha for each subject and a subject specific random effect, capital M, for how strong they are relative to average. Somebody might be diseased, but above one because they would be well above one without the disease. They're stronger than average. So we've got a, a specific random effect per muscle for each subject. We fit the model jointly, all the parameters, the logistic decline to these, and we can estimate the disease age of every individual jointly across all muscles, as well as model where we think the patient is going. So here is knee flex with disease age as the model estimated disease age. This fits extremely well. For a patient of a certain disease age, we can predict their knee flex extremely well. For dorsiflex, this looks much better than it looked before and because dorsiflex helps drive disease age. And you can see this is fitting very, very well for where we think they'll be. A subject who is at 50% knee extension tends to be at 21% of their, of their ankle. Knee extension, this is the quadricep. Here you see a little bit of decline, but it's very, very slow over a 20 year span. That's what we would predict. And by the way, a clinical measure that would be reflective of knee extension would be a terrible clinical trial endpoint because it just doesn't change much. Be very difficult, various walking measures because of this. Grip matches very well in disease age. A subject who's at 50% of knee extension is estimated to be at 78% of grip. But you can see it declines over the 20 years. They go from 78% down to about uh, 10%. Hip extension fits very, very well as well. So now we've got a model that the muscles behave for these 32 patients and they fit a disease progression model very, very well. Here is the mean estimate for each muscle, the collection of the five. For any disease age estimated on the x-axis, we have the estimated value of muscle strength as a proportion of their maximum.
you can see the quadricept is the one that just doesn't decline much over the course of the disease. But somebody who's at disease age zero, you can see they're having uh, uh, ankle and knee extension, their muscles declining very rapidly, while the others are not. But somebody who's later in the disease has different muscles in there. This becomes a really neat model endpoint because it incorporates everybody across the disease span. Somebody's declining somewhere, and this disease age parameter picks that up. Here are the individuals we looked at before. This was patient A, where you saw their estimates, the ones that are zero are predicted to stay that way over the next 10 years. And we can predict the mean decline for each muscle over 10 years with a confidence interval around that prediction as well. This subject B, while they're doing quite well now, given the disease progression, we expect to see strong decline in knee flex uh, for this individual. Over the next 10 years, we expect to have very little, maybe 10% of their knee flex muscle left. The quadriceps not gonna do much. We know that from the muscle. So if we were looking at this individual and giving them a drug, we would want to look at what happened to their knee flex because it's what's moving on them. For patient C, their knee flex is already down quite low, and we're gonna get much better information about looking at their grip uh, in this position because that's a muscle may move here rather than looking at knee extension. But we can look at the transition of their disease and we can predict what the model says is gonna to happen to this patient. So now we can model treatment effect within the model. You saw that each muscle had a change in slope. We don't believe that this is gonna change fat to muscle. We're not gonna reverse this disease. Nobody believes that can happen. So we're gonna change the rate of decline of individuals because they decline from fat to muscle at a slower rate. We're gonna alter each of the betas in the model by giving them a disease and seeing if we can change that slope beta at the point they start taking the drug. So here's three situations where we have a muscle that's nearly full strength in the upper left. We impart a, a, a treatment that slows the disease or stops the progression entirely as gamma zero, and you can see the muscle goes straight across. In 10 years, you could see that in a clinical trial. The, the solid line to the zero. And then you see 25, 50, and 75% declines if we get a muscle at the right point, we can pick it up. If you go to the upper right, a muscle that's near zero, we can give a great treatment and we may never know. It may take years to differentiate zero from 8%. And we have one in the middle. What we should do is look at every single muscle simultaneously, what happens when we give a treatment, and the muscles in the right position will be the most informative to us. So here is an example of a normal progression for patient C. Here's what we would predict would happen if we give them a drug that stops the decline of the disease. We can pick that up in a clinical trial. We can't pick up the red, it doesn't move. We can pick up the blue uh, and the green and a little bit of the yellow in this situation. So now uh, we, we can focus on the wide range of the disease. We don't pick a single clinical measure that's only relevant for a particular spot, and we observe the disease age changes for these patients. Here are some clinical measures as a function of our estimated disease age for each person. So somebody at minus 10, so they're very early in the disease, their ability to walk, the distance they can walk, and their ability is much higher than those at the end. The entire scale of this incorporates clinical outcomes because it's the, 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 the 10 muscles at the same time. If you look at their walking distance, these, this parameter disease age corresponds very, very well with the clinical measures of importance, but we don't have to focus on this as the endpoint. We can focus on the quantitative muscle assessment. So what we're doing is we're proposing a design that we enroll all patients, we give every one of them a treatment. We have no placebo patients. The, the disease progression model is the historical comparison. We compare what they would do if they never got the drug, where would they be, and then we look at where they are with the drug. Does it perform the disease progression model? We can treat every single patient, no patient on placebo, 
and we've got a much more fine model because every patient can be in the trial, not just those in the tiny region where they have trouble walking. Uh, the disease progression model's updated over the entire course of the trial. It's getting smarter, and we're studying the drugs at exactly the same time. It takes a problem undoable with our own mo old methods, alpha 0.05, we can't run the trial. We can't give patients placebo. There's no way to do this. This brings about a Bayesian solution, disease progression model. It's doable and it makes a lot of scientific sense. So this is our attempt to bring Bayesian statistics to rare diseases. Thank you.